So I'm pleased to welcome for the second BCT lecture series, um, Rosemary Sue. Rosemary's a acoustician and senior consultant at Accent Tech. Her areas of concentration include architectural acoustics, mechanical system noise and vibration control, and environmental acoustics. Rosemary and Accent Tech were not only the acoustic consultants here in our new design building, but have been responsible for acoustic, for acoustic design in over 50 higher education products, projects throughout the Northeast. So on our campus, beside the design building, Rosemary and Accent Tech have worked on over 25 projects, including projects as diverse as the central heating plant and the old chapel. So with that, I'd like to welcome Rosemary. So I want, I'm here today to give you all a little bit about, uh, to talk about acoustics in the design building here and also a few other projects uh, that's on campus. And uh, hopefully today you'll come out of this and that you will understand some of the basics of architectural acoustics and uh, learn how to categorize a few of the elements that we look at when we look at a building and the design of acoustics and uh, hopefully understand how some of this, these decisions are made on demising constructions and how spaces are laid out and then learning how to look at a finish and determine whether something is sound absorptive or not. So who am I? Why am I here? Um, I was here for the opening of this building a few months ago when uh, Carl pulled me aside and asked me if I would give a lecture about this building and I gladly accepted and you know having familiarity with this project I thought it would be good to share some of the thoughts and the uh, acoustics considerations that we've had in this project. So uh, my background is in acoustics in Masters of Engineering at Penn State. And before that, I was an electrical engineer. But I decided that that wasn't really the path for me. Um, our role in the project, we are kind of a silent consultant somewhat. Uh, and uh, I didn't list everybody here, but for acoustics, a lot of times uh, all the other sub-consultants under the architect have drawing sets that are part of that. And then together they submit that document for construction. And for acoustics, oftentimes we have to critique the architect's drawings and also the engineer's drawings. And that includes mechanical engineers, the structural engineers, the architects. So a lot of times is work done by others that we're trying to revise again and again. So it's, it's a little bit challenging that it's a little different from all the other fields. And then together with that, we have to incorporate our recommendation and repeat again sometimes with the construction team to make sure that they get implemented correctly. So a couple things that we think about in acoustics. Um, are listed here. And uh, I think what most people think of when they think of acoustics is performing art spaces. You designed a space and it sounds great. And what did you think about when you, you know, designed this performance hall? That's under mostly the room acoustics aspect of the acoustics field. But actually, there's a lot of other items that's involved and that we don't hear about unless there is a problem. So the Green one is the sound isolation, which is more about the architecture infrastructure. And then the background noise is oftentimes related to the mechanical system noise. And also anything ranging from you know, transient noise from traffic to toilet flushing and all that sort. So it could include a lot of other things. And uh, lastly is the amplification system, which is electronic enhancement of speech and music and sound. So. Those all go hand in hand in a lot of spaces that we don't normally think about. You know, when you see me, a lot of times, sometimes I say, oh, I work in acoustics. They're like, do you work at Bose? Or, you know, I, I, I don't know. Everyone has slightly different associations with sound and acoustics. And uh, even though they're all under the same, uh, they're all signals to me, 
they're defined as noise on some items, and other items are defined as signal, which is music and my speech. That those are all signals. But the noisy part of hearing something that you don't want to hear, like the wood shop or you know anything like that, that would be considered noise. But really, it's all sound, and you know we look at everything. So sound is particles vibrating through an elastic medium. And you can see here a closer look. It's actually just longitudinal trans, uh, vibration across. So the energy is transmitted by the vibration through a gas, liquid, as well as solids. In solid, the transmission is a little more complex. But this is a very simplistic way of understanding what sound is really doing. So there's a lot of energy moving from one side to another. And the sound is defined with a lot of characteristics, like the amplitude of the wave. And that's the level that it's at. The frequency, which when you think of a piano, the lower frequency is the left side keys, and the higher frequencies are the shorter strings, which are on the upper range. And then there's also propagation. Uh, naturally, if I speak, it's going to decay over time. So it gets softer if you stand farther away from me. Um, for speed, it varies depending on the fluid that it's in. So in air, it's one speed. And in up, different altitudes, it's a different speed. And in structures, in solids, it's another speed. And then it also diffracts. So it goes, it bends over different geometry and shapes. And so it's not just a line right across. It does uh, change in direction. And as I mentioned earlier, the frequency is visually defined this way. On the left side, you get the higher frequency. So on the right side of the piano keys, those are higher frequency sounds. And that means that there are more cycles happening per second. And on the lower frequency, it's on the left side, side of the piano keys. And those are slower oscillating cycles per second. And those are subjectively typically described as a boomy sound or roaring. Uh, sub, uh, also, a, a lot of times, the higher pitch is hissy. Um, or tonal is another commonly uh, used word. So for us, uh, when we listen to many of you tell us, describe to us what you hear, we have to kind of identify exactly what we're hearing. And then we also go and verify it and measure it for you so that we can figure out what we're actually all listening to. And surprisingly, a um, so, little side story here is uh, we had to identify some sound that somebody was hearing in their house. And it was almost like ghost hunting because you couldn't really figure out. The husband said one thing and the wife said another. And we had to uh, actually take them separately and measure the sound and trying to figure out what they were hearing. And it turns out they were not hearing the same sound that was bothering them. And so that was very interesting that when you describe it subjectively, it's very hard for us to identify that we had to recreate the sound and make sure that they actually identify what sound they were hearing. Um, our hearing, uh, because of us humans, we have a big range of hearing uh, range, which is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And uh, our threshold is up here, which is pretty flat across all frequencies. But if you notice the green line here, this is the frequency on the bottom. Sorry for not having units. And this is the level um, that we are more sensitive to the mid and high frequency sounds. And then this is also where all our vowels and consonants are. And so for a lot of noise that are typically described as roaring, it takes a lot more level before you start complaining about it. So going a uh, little bit by little bit, I, I want to break this down so that hopefully you leave with a little understanding of the different uh, aspects that I'm going to talk, talk about today. And I had made a little circle on the side with the four different uh, shapes that we had earlier, ovals, I should call it. And so the first one I want to talk about is 
how background sound plays in our design. And that's mostly mechanical and plumbing and elect some electrical components. So a lot of that is kind of the dirty, ugly, be behind the scene noise that you think of. And as I said earlier, we're more sensitive to the mid and high frequency. So these are single number curves that were standardized for mechanical system noise to figure out how loud something is to our ear. So if you measured something that was NC35, let's say, then it would be the tangential of the, the, the highest level that hits that curve would be the level that we're talking about. And so whenever we start with a project, we have to identify what the levels we're trying to achieve. And sometimes it go, goes naturally below that, which is very quiet. And um, here's a range, and uh, A is the threshold of hearing. So for extremely quiet spaces like recording studios and concert halls, we're trying to hit the threshold of hearing, which is very, very quiet. And the quietest equivalent of what you can imagine outside is, I believe, in Grand Canyon or somewhere really far out in the middle of nowhere where you're not getting any sounds at all from the environment. So that's the type of uh, sound that one would uh, aspire to design to. And then there are other ranges of elements that uh, spaces that are listed here just for typical background sound levels that we're going for. And so that's so that you have a little idea of where we start in the drawing board before we even look at the mechanical system. There are a couple of things that uh, is, contribute to noise. And the, a couple of solutions that are associated with that. And the three top ones are, as I said, the mechanical system noise. That the, if you had smaller ducts, which has high, uh, same CFM but higher velocities, then it's going to create the additional laminar flow that creates a lot more noise. So if you had really large duct, ducts and had lower um, than uh, normal, then you would create a lot less noise. For fan noise, where the actual noise source is at, that is usually where also it creates a lot of airborne noise that we're hearing. And that's the noise that's transmitted down the duct. And so uh, I said earlier, sound traveling through air down the duct into all of these uh, items here, so the distribution systems. So that, that's the final receiver is here, but somewhere far away or maybe over here, actually, for this room, the fan coil unit is right there. So, you know, these are the type of things we try to identify early and figure out how much noise that's going to produce. And then in addition, these equipment are rotating and vib generating energy that are vibrating, and they need to vibrate and transmit that energy somewhere. So when it's vibrating, then we have to worry about allowing that to vibrate freely without connecting to the building structure. So these are kind of the items that we look at. And around campus, if you walk around the science building and the life science building, the airflow requirements are much higher because these are chemistry and you know science labs that requires a lot more air exchanges. And because of that, then naturally we'll have a higher flow of air and noisier. And those fans are much bigger too. And in a design building and the visual art building, you will notice that it's much quieter because first of all, the demand is a lot lower and therefore they naturally have smaller fans also and they are quieter. And within our building in here, there's a little variety too. So we give ourselves a little less um, tolerance in spaces like this that require a higher signal to no, uh, lower background sound and so that you can hear me talk. And then in spaces where they're considered labs and working spaces where people break out and do their own work, we usually allow them to have higher background sound levels. So I kind of alluded that 
we need to predict how much noise we're going to hear from these guys over here. So this is actually a plan from earlier on, on that the mechanical engineer had produced for fan coil units for the studios. Um, and it's, you know, they, they decided they wanted to have the C, uh, cross laminated timber structure exposed and the duct had to stick out outside of it. And we had to negotiate with them on enclosing the fan coil units so that we don't hear the noise coming out of the box. But not only that, we also had to worry about noise coming from the fan itself going down the duct and coming out of the openings. And in doing so, we provided, we were able to figure out what the sound sources, the sound levels are, and calculate that and estimate what the levels are going to be. And the noise control, this is not from the actual project, but this is just a good image of you would put energy dissipating elements in the duct so that it helps reduce the sound that's coming out of the diffusers. So these are called silencers and sometimes called sound attenuators. And then to control the vibration coming from these equipment, we also have to identify them in design as early as possible so that we can tell them which ones we want to vibration isolate. And this we would do by identifying them in the specification and saying, look, you need to add vibration isolators and they need to achieve this criteria. And they, that way they're able to freely vibrate on the springs without transmitting it onto the mass below. So these are pumps that are uh, on floated uh, concrete inertia bases that are on springs. And this is another, this is like outside on the roof with uh, isolators. Unfortunately, things like this cannot be always 100% certain because I'm not here all the time during construction to make sure that everything gets ex executed correctly. So here are some pictures of what happens when you coordinate one thing, but then something gets short-circuited. And so here's a photo of the conduits for a vibrating equipment that's supposed to be vibration isolated by the springs, but they're short circuited to the roof by the conduits. So, um, you know, it, it, in an ideal condition, <laughs> somebody's smiling over there. It's like, I've had that happen to me before. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we try our best to catch everything we can, but sometimes you go out after it's already built and then you realize there are all these conditions that. Um, could have been prevented. Here, uh, at, uh, the other thing that mechanical systems produce is noise to the community. And, uh, you know, this is something, this might look familiar to you. This is the Letterly Building uh, Graduate uh, Research Center. And right across from them are some dorm rooms. And uh, I, a while ago, I got called because they had installed some cooling towers to eject heat out of the building, and they thought that they would just leave it the way that they're kind of like this out on the roof. And of course, the residences across the hall were complaining about noise. So we uh, helped them by figuring out how tall of a barrier we needed around, and this is the barrier around the cooling tower, very old photo there. And I think that's still around on campus. I just drove by it. Uh, earlier today. So um, community noise is pretty, uh, quite requires a lot of planning and requires a lot of coordination and prediction. Uh, we rely very heavily on the manufacturer's data on the fans so that we can model and predict how noisy something's going to emit in the community. And uh, sometimes something may look very noisy and you'll see a lot of these along uh, North Pleasant, I think, with all the science buildings. And some of them have sound attenuators and others may not. And for whatever reason, you know, they decided to have barriers or not. And th there are a lot of reasons why they don't have or have them. But a lot of times it's the height, the wind is, you know, the wind load is too high. And so we are always in a struggle to get what we want and we don't always get what we want. <laughs> so uh, here's the, attenuators that are shown here. 
Um, we've talked a lot mostly about steady state noise. And a lot of the times there are also transient noise that are kind of unexpected or hard to control and that are somewhat out of our hands. And uh, those are commonly construction noise and vibration. Here we have uh, in New England Conservatory building right next to another project. And if you notice, they actually tell the construction workers not to be there before 7 o'clock so that they can mitigate a lot of the noise generated impacting the music school that's right next door. Um, and the microphone, yeah, the microphone is up there. And this is the bigger, looking from the top of that roof, looking down. So we're able to monitor this. And one of the things we did at the life science building here, actually, is that um, they were really worried about their own construction noise impacting the nearby buildings, as well as the residences nearby. And so they proactively, um, the construction team monitored this uh, vibration and noise. And they had real time uh, data. And if it exceeded a certain, certain threshold, they would alert the construction team about it. And it's a little micromanaging, but you know some construction teams really find it useful. And then later on, they kept the system a little longer. And they realized that, you know, that their own uh, equipment are getting impacted by the vibration and noise from some other construction site that was happening down the street. Like, I think it was the dorm building further down uh, north. So I thought that was just interesting that, you know, you learn something new about who's actually generating the noise and the vibration all the time from doing all these documentation. But a lot of times this is useful for the scientists so that they can throw away the data that they think are not valid. Uh, when there's noise and vibration intrusion, they can't, uh, they, they, there's too many variables that are not from the ones that they're testing. So it's actually very useful way of determining when their data is actually valid. The other, the next part I want to talk about is the architectural coordination, the structural, the infrastructure uh, part that makes a space sound quiet, not from the mechanical system, but by how much architectural separation there is in a space. A lot of that is um, outdoor to outdoor, which is what we talked about briefly. But we also have outdoor to indoor, which we don't have a lot here. And then a lot of that uh, for this project is inside to inside. And so this is where I, I, we're going to kind of talk more about. So little sound isolation is, has to do with how much mass generally is, and space between the source that's generating the sound and the receiver. So here's just an illustrative example of if you have music practice rooms from one room to another, how do you architecturally separate them so that you don't hear as much of the noise? Because I'm considering music noise now if it's not my own music, right? If you're playing the music, then it's music. But then if you can hear next door, all of a sudden it's counted as noise. And then also the kid sitting out here is not going to be bothered by the sound that's transmitted into the cord. So a little example here, if we think about early on in planning, we try our very best to convince our design team how to plan their spaces so that they are not right next, not, no two sensitive spaces are right next to each other. It's very challenging because you know, the site might be limited. We only have so many floors. And so, for example, in this case, we're trying to separate the two larger spaces. So by putting more buffer spaces in between, this is a relatively inexpensive way of providing sound isolation. And this is actually in our space right here. But then we also have other types of challenging, which is that the BCT lab and the uh, wood shop is a kind of a showcase space and you wanted to come in to the common and look into the space. So there's glass involved. 
we're worried about noise generated in here from impacting. And now I'm going to explain why there was a vestibule here, which I noticed somebody propped open, which is not very functional for my purposes. But the reason that it was there is because we didn't want a door that directly opens from the wood shop, which is the noisiest space, into the common. So I said, well, you know, the best option I can think of is you enter from some other location that's not inside the building. Well, if that's not an option, then you should enter via vestibule with two sets of doors. Now, I understand that's very difficult for carts to go in and out. But, you know, this is, that, that, this, these are the reasons how certain designs are set up. And then maybe some person going through the wood shop is cursing at me, and I'm really sorry. But I, I noticed that it was propped open. Um, anyways, so we worry about this type of planning. There's that noise I just said. And then instead, we go this way, and we just worry about what type of glazing we have at the red arrow so that we don't have to um, worry about the door, which is usually the weakest point in the assembly. So, you know, a lot of times we get a question that's like, I got a great wall, why do I still hear noise from so clearly from another place? So I said that sound travels through air and, and also through solids. So what happens is sound is traveling through the solid as well and in the structure. So if we don't decouple as much of the elements in a noisy space, then we oftentimes miss certain spots. And then these are sounds that you can hear somewhat clearly in adjacent space. So that there, those are called structure-borne sound transmission. So in the case of our noisy wood job that I like to use as an example. I don't know if the chair is still there, but anyways, the offices and the seminar rooms are right above. And you know, we said, hey guys, this is going to be a problem because you know we're making a lot of noise, or I, you know, I'm predicting this level, which I've measured in the past. Wood shops are noisy, and you have all these columns also in there, and they're all tied to this and we need to upgrade the floor ceiling construction. So there's the arrow. And then the other challenge is, so I'm trying to decouple this, and we're working with a relatively unknown construction in the US. And there's a lot of research and data published in the Europe side. And so you know we had to research on how that can be incorporated with something we're more familiar with. And we were able to uh, figure out two options, which is that we either decouple the structures, which the yellow stuff is the decoupling, by doing this, or we can do it below, which is on the ceiling side, and have a little bit of redundancy on the wall so that they're isolated from the slab itself. So they ended up, the architect ended up going with this option. And then you don't even notice that unless I told you because they added absorption underneath the drywall ceiling that's shown here. So a lot of that is hidden behind, but you know, the reason certain things are, you know, why is the ceiling lower here or some, you know, some, a lot of that is, you know, we, we, we fought really hard for them. Unfortunately for me, in this drawing, I think, oh, I pointed out to them, there are all these columns that are exposed, these guys here, that go from one floor to another. And ideally, I would like to enclose them in drywall, frame it out, decouple it. I did not win that battle, so those are exposed in the shop. So, you know, you, you might hear some, but, you know, it's just like the intent is there, and we fight, and then we, you know, I don't always win. So, um, but at least, we got the glazing so that we could at least separate most of the sound. And like I said, the door is not the weakest point. Here's another just type of uh, challenges. I don't know if this was actually built the shaft wall this way, but originally it was going to be shaft with wood somewhere in there. And I, my point of, of illustrating this is that we need to have not just the beam there and the wood, that we needed a framed wall on the inside so that 
we can also work with decoupling the potentially vibrating mechanical shaft from the classroom. So all this effort that I go through, and sometimes I still find holes. So here are some holes that, you know, what does not block sound? A big door undercut, sometimes uh, coordination between mechanical engineer and I, and then somehow they want the undercut for ventilation reasons. So there's a clear cut that's not intended to be there. Um, uh, this is just an image uh, of our little balcony here. But my point here is that if you have gaps between glass, then the glass itself is not going to block much sound. It's the holes are there. So this is more of a visual barrier than anything else. Um, and then I get asked a lot, if I spray something, would I solve my problem for blocking noise? And there's no mass. So no is the answer for all of you here. But you know, I'll still get asked you know, occasionally about this. So all of that comes into play into the part that I think most people think of us doing when we're designing in a space for acoustics. And that's the room acoustic side and the amplification. And these are the signal side of things, things that make a space sound good and clear. You know, the outdoors versus indoors difference. When we're outside, there's nothing reflecting back at us so that they can sing, sing the sound of music and the only thing that's bouncing back is from the cliff because that's the only reflection you're getting. Inside a space though, you're getting reflections from the room and the volume that it, it, you're enclosing. You know, Like we're in this space, it's enclosed, there's a little reflection back at me. So how did this all happen? There was a Harvard professor that was assigned to figure out um, how to make one of their lecture halls sound good. And they said, you know what, the uh, Sanders Hall sounded really good. Why don't you figure out what, how to make this other hall sound as good as that? And so to figure out, um, he used a, Saban used a um, organ pipe and played it and figured out the amount of time it takes for impulse sound to decay. And impulse sound is like this, but back in the day, she probably used just the organ and then stopped it and figured out how long it took. And using a stopwatch, figured out how long something would decay in a room. And he also found that we are absorptive. So the more people you have in a space, the more acoustically dead it would sound. So if I were lecturing in an empty room right now with fewer of you, it'll probably sound like there's more of a ring to my voice. So uh, those are reverberation time is dependent on the volume of the space and the amount of absorption. And uh, oh yeah, I forgot to say, he was, because he identified that humans are absorptive, he enclosed himself in a, you know, <laughs> measurement box. So, you know, for a very long reverberation time, think of uh, some churches although not many these days, but a lot of the historic churches, and also in a pool, natatorium. You know, you have long reverberation times, and uh, this one just has a metal deck with no absorption in there and a huge volume. And by adding absorption in there, one of our consultants were, was able to bring it down to 1.7 seconds, which is a lot shorter of a uh, impulse sound. So the absorption is all these materials are sealing. Sometimes they look like a, a secondary layer to the fiber. These, these, uh, they help dissipate the sound energy that is directed at them into the material. And then so that few lesser of that energy is coming back and reflected back to the space. Um, it's described in percentages from zero to one. And so one is very absorptive. Zero is not absorptive at all. And uh, you can see here the range for just an idea. And also they are, uh, 
that's the wrong button. They're frequency dependent. So just because you have absorption for one frequency doesn't mean it covers for everything, which is why that for certain spaces it's very complicated because you may want a fuller range of absorption than others. And uh, for this project, here are a series of uh, absorption that you may see in the project. Behind the slatted wood in the common, there's a spray material that's absorptive. In the shops and also the lab on the first floor, as I mentioned, below the gypsum board ceiling, they have these fiber cement, uh, wood cement uh, boards, and behind them they have absorption. The actual product here is not super absorptive, but the yellow stuff behind it is. And then in this room and other rooms, you have acoustical panel ceilings, which are also absorptive. And not all of them perform the same way, so it's important to look at the absorption coefficient and figure out for a different type of space what amount of absorption you need. And then we also have fabric wrap panels. And again, you know, some are covered not with uh, sound absorptive material, and others are. And so it really depends on the manufacturer and also what intended use you are trying to, you know, if it's tackable, it's less absorptive than the non-tackable. So for this space, they're tackable. So what is not sound absorptive in this space, in our building here? <clears throat> the wood is not. As much as it looks very warm, it's actually very reflective. Concrete, that I think most people can figure out. Gypsum wallboard is also generally not super sound absorptive. And glass is also reflective. And so, you know, this was a challenge for us because of how much the design team wanted to showcase the BCT, the CLT uh, finish that uh, we don't get a lot of places to negotiate for absorption. And so in one of my challenges that I have had is what I just said is that where all the studios are is where all the beautiful wood is. And I really wanted to cover it up, but nobody wanted me to cover it up. And so unfortunately, if you go up to the second and third floor, you can hear the difference even. As the volume increases, the reverberation time is a lot longer. And, you know, even for wall panels, they could cover some of that. But I don't know why that hasn't been added yet, because it was already mentioned to me on day one that we needed more absorption in there. And so that, that to me is something that as design team, we always have to negotiate with everybody on how to make sure that it's a functional for everyone in the space. Um, to kind of put everything together, some of the more exciting things that are happening right now is that we can make predictions using uh, room acoustic mo modeling for very uh, extremely complex geometry. So you can see on the left here, this is actually SketchUp, and we can translate and import that model into our acoustic model for our analysis. So it provides us with the coordinates for the geometry and the planes. So uh, I know that you guys use SketchUp here, so it's something I thought would be interesting to you. Um, this is generated from ARM software for acoustics, and it helps us uh, identify more than just the reverberation time, but also check for unwanted reflections and also, you know, whether you're getting enough lateral reflections from the sidewalls and enough you know, diffusion. So it's useful in that uh, for more critical listening spaces, that's what we use. And then for sound reinforcement system, such as the sound system, we can also input those into models and figure out how the sound loudspeakers are distributing the sound in a space. So these are, you know, these are loudspeakers and they can figure out where the coverage is 
good and where is lacking, maybe up here. And then lastly, we can combine all the things that I just talked about. And sorry for this image, it's just our marketing department. It's kind of cheesy looking, but um, we have this room that's extremely low in reverberation time that's basically anechoic, which means that almost no reflection comes back at you so that we can create a virtual space and listen to a space before it's made, constructed. So we can model it during design and have a listen to it prior to construction. And it's very useful to design tool because you can have, oh, what if I had this option and then all these other options and then you can test them all out as much as you want and take a listen to it. Because a lot of times when I talk in numbers, you know, I just get a glaze over and people may not understand what I'm trying to explain as well. But if you hear it yourself, then you're like, I don't like this reverberation time of whatever three seconds. And that's not good. We need to add the absorption in there or whatever it may be. So um, I, I like that this is the trend of where the design is going. And so, you know, in my opinion, the imagination really is the limit. And we can explore so many options in our design without the cost of, you know, testing it during construction, during a mock-up. Now, there are some values to mock up because not all constructions are ideal and a model tends to be in an ideal condition. So, uh, but I, I find that for room acoustics especially, that is very useful and so is uh, the sound amplification system. And uh, it, the model can also introduce things like, how much noise am I gonna hear from next door if they're playing music right next to me while I'm presenting? So they can hear my voice overlaid with the noise from next door based on the numbers that we figure out. And then why don't we also add the background noise from the mechanical system? So it, it, it's really the next level of where we're heading. And uh, this is also going on the, show, on the road with the Oculus, which is a binaural system rather than an ambisonic, which is in our room. So all of these are travel ready for people to experience. So I, you know, I, I think it's an exciting field. You know, I hope it interests you enough to, uh, you know, ask some questions about it. But uh, thank you very much. And uh, here's my email. If you have any questions, complaints about the building, just let go it out. So thank you so much. Thank you.